Good evening. I'm very glad to spend some time with you this evening. How many of you have I not been with before? How many have never been with me before or been exposed to? Okay, and how many have had a little bit of experience at least with nonviolent communication? Okay, a little bit. I'll try not to go too fast for those who haven't had any experience or too slow for the old timers. I regret that I'll not be speaking to you in your language. Especially perfect Deutsch, aber niemand kann mehr verstehen. So, uh, and though we only have a little time, I'd like to have this be interactive tonight, because I think people usually get a lot more out of trying it out as we go along. So if you've got something to write with and on, I'll uh, be having you try it out as we go along. So, uh, think of somebody that you have a conflict with. And uh, this might be uh, somebody at home. Maybe you have a child at home that says horrible things, such as, no. Uh, or maybe you have somebody at work that's not producing as you would like. Or maybe something else. So think of a real situation where somebody is behaving in a way you don't like. And what I'd like you to write down to get us started tonight is, uh, let's imagine that you go to them and uh, you decide to be honest with them. So write down what you would say to this person if you were to be honest with them about what they do that you don't like. What would you say? Well, maybe you've already done it, then write down what you did say to them. So I'll give you a minute or two to get that written down. What you would say to this person, to be honest. Okay, now let's um, take a look at what you wrote. And if there's any language in what you wrote that the other person might hear as a criticism or blame or a psychological analysis that implies some pathology on their part, My prediction is that uh, one of two things will happen. First, you will create more resistance than cooperation. And if the person agrees with your criticism and decides to change their behavior, you'll pay for it. <laughs> Nonviolent communication is based on the premise that any words we use that imply evil or bad or wrongness on the other person's part is the kind of thinking that creates violence on our planet. So nonviolent communication shows us a way of being even more honest, but being honest from the heart. 
saying two things, basically. What's alive in you? How you are? And to do that very honestly, but without using any words that criticize, blame, judge. It's an honesty of the heart. And for that reason, I refer to it for playful reasons. I call it giraffe language because giraffes have the largest heart of any land animal. Okay, now, in giraffe language, we're very honest. But we're honest from the heart. And this requires that we be able to be literate at saying four things to people when they're doing something that we don't like. To make four things clear to them. First, to make clear what they did that you don't like. If we're talking about something we don't like. Later we'll talk about how to be honest without any praise or compliments. Praise and compliments are part of the same language that contributes to the violence on our planet. So we'll show you this evening Another way of being honest when people do things we do like that has more power and less danger than praise and compliments. So one of the ingredients that we need to make clear is what the person has done that we don't like. What has the person done that we don't like? So write that down specifically. What did the person do that you don't like? Now, having asked uh, thousands of people over the years uh, that question, what does the other person do? My experience is that uh, less than 20% of the people answer the question that I ask. Instead of writing down what the person does, they mix in a diagnosis. Let me give you an example. I was working with some teachers in a school. They were having a conflict with their administrator, so I was asked by the school superintendent if I would help resolve the conflict between the staff and the administrator. So I met first with the staff, and I asked them that question I just asked you. I said, what's one thing that the administrator does that you don't like? And one of the teachers immediately says, he has a big mouth. Now, do you see the difference between the question I ask and the answer I got? I didn't say, what size mouth does he have? <laughs> I ask what he does. And I pointed this out to him. That, and then he thought for a moment and says, he talks too much. I said, too much is the diagnosis. I'm asking for an observation. He couldn't do it. He, everything that came to his mind was a criticism or judgment of the other person. So uh, one of his fellow students uh, tried to help him. She says, well, I know what he does that he's talking about. I say, what's that? She said, he thinks he's the only one that has any intelligence. No, I said, there's, there's another diagnosis. Another woman tried to help her, and she said, he wants to be the center of attention all the time. No, that's a guess at what his needs are, but that doesn't tell me the answer to my question. Now, I wasn't surprised that they had trouble answering that, because Jadu Krishnamurti, the Indian philosopher, says that the highest form of human intelligence is the ability to observe without evaluating. Studies of racism, sexism, and other form of dangerous thinking 
shows that people who think in that way can't separate fact and opinion. So this is a very important skill to have if we want to be honest in resolving conflicts. To be very specific about what people do that we like or don't like and not to mix it up with any evaluation. So I showed them how to do this and finally they got clear what he got clear what he meant by talks too much. Here's what it sounded like when he made an observation. He said, Marshall, in our faculty meetings, no matter what's on the agenda, he usually tells a story about his war experience or childhood experience. And our meetings last longer than they're scheduled because of that. Ah, oh, see, that would be an observation. That's what he did. And it was decided that he would talk to him about that at the next uh, meeting. And he suggested that I be there just in case. And at the next meeting, I saw pretty much what they were talking about because no matter what was said, the administrator would start talking about other things. And, but nobody said anything at first. Uh, you could tell from their nonverbal behavior they weren't happy. They looked at the ceiling, uh, they poked each other, they yawned, they looked at their watches, they held the watch up to the ear. <laughs> so I said, excuse me, uh, isn't somebody going to say something? And the man who spoke up in our first meeting looked at the administrator and said, Ed, you have a big mouth. So much for my teaching abilities. <laughs> so take a look at what you wrote down and see if uh, you answered that second question I asked you. Did you write down a clear observation? It's a very important part of nonviolent communication. Now, how do we evaluate that behavior in nonviolent communication? Well, I've already told you, we evaluate it without reference, without any language that implies wrongness. No criticism, no blame. The center of this evaluation is our needs, our needs. See? That's very important because, you see, all human beings have the same needs. So if we evaluate from the heart, from our needs, the other person sees another human being like himself or herself. We don't then divide people up into categories of good and evil, right and wrong. But we make very clear what need of ours wasn't met. I was asked to mediate between two tribes in northern Nigeria, a Christian tribe and a Muslim tribe. About 40% of the population in both tribes had been killed in the war that they had. Every Muslim house had been burned to the ground. So it took a colleague of mine quite a time to get the chiefs on both sides to come into a room and see if we couldn't resolve this without further violence. So I asked, uh, when we were sitting on both sides of the table, I said, I'm very confident that if we can hear each other's needs, we can resolve this without further violence. So whoever would like to start, I'd like you to just say, what needs of yours are not being met in this conflict? The chief from the Christian tribe looked across the table and screamed, You people are murderers! Now, do you predict that made the other side more compassionate about his needs? See, how tragic that about 80% of the people I work with around the world, they have almost no vocabulary for their needs but they're very good at telling other people what's wrong with them in a conflict situation. 
which is why I think we have the violence on our planet, as I've already said. So that stimulated a member of the other tribe to scream back across the table, you've been trying to dominate us. We won't tolerate it anymore. So notice, I asked for needs, and each side told me about the pathology of the other side. See, how tragic, how tragic. Well, my job then in that situation as a mediator was to use some technology for translating criticism and blame into needs. You see, a premise of nonviolent communication is that all language that criticizes or blames is a tragic expression of an unmet need. A tragic expression of an unmet need. So when this chief uh, screams murderer, he had a need that wasn't getting met. See. But he thinks that you have to tell people what's wrong with them to get them to change. When just the opposite is what often happens. What you see is what you get. If you see an employee as lazy, because they're not getting things done as rapidly as you like, and they hear you using a word like lazy, don't expect them to enjoy doing the work. Or as I put in a little song I once wrote, tell me that you're disappointed if I say no to your advances. But calling me a frigid man, won't increase your future chances. What you see is what you get. So here I ask both sides what their needs are, and now they're screaming diagnoses at each other. So my job was to use some technology that I'm going to show you how to use this evening. Giraffe ears. With this wonderful technology, <laughs> you are conscious of what I just said, that all criticism, all blame, is a tragic, suicidal expression of an unmet need. So with these ears, you learn how to hear what's alive in the other person behind any criticism or blame that they express. So I use the word wolf as a playful way of looking at the language of violence, you see. The language of violence. I call wolf language. Wolves aren't violent, but I just like the word wolf. <laughs> so when this chief screams, murderer, put the ears on. Put these ears on. What need was he trying to express that wasn't getting met? Got any idea? Holler it out. What need do you think he wasn't getting met? Need for safety. Need for safety, see? She's got giraffe ears on. She doesn't hear the criticism. So I said to the chief, uh, Chief, uh, are you saying that your need for safety is not being met by how conflicts are being resolved? He said, that's right. Yes. Okay. Then I said uh, to people on the other side, would somebody on this side of the table please tell me what the chief said that his needs were that weren't getting met? See, in nonviolent communication, we never assume that message sent is message received. Because when people have been blaming or criticizing or judging each other, it's hard for them to see any truth, see this enemy image that they have. So when I said, uh, would somebody on this side of the table please tell me what the chief said his needs are, one of the chiefs said, then why did you kill my son? 
I had been told before I went in things might be a little tense because there were three people in the room that knew that somebody was in the room who had killed a member of their family. So I had to do a little work with this person to kind of pull him by the ears to hear the other person's needs. Okay, so now I've got one side with my help of this wonderful technology expressing a need. I got the other side to hear it. Then I translated their judgment of the other side that they, uh, they were too domineering, too controlling. And I turned that into a need, that they had a need for more involvement in decisions that were made, more respect for their ability to make choices. And I got the other side to hear it. Now, just that much took about well over an hour, because there was a lot of screaming going on. But finally, I got them both sides to hear at least one need. We had others that we had to get clear as well. But at that moment, one of the chiefs that hadn't spoken said to me, Marshal, if we know how to communicate this way, we don't have to kill each other. See? If we know how to connect with what's alive in each other without making any enemy images, any criticism, we can just hear each other's needs, it's amazing how conflicts would seem impossible to resolve almost seem to resolve themselves. So write down what need of yours isn't met in this situation that I ask you to think about. What need of yours? Now take a look at what you wrote down, and if what you wrote down expresses what you want the other person to do, then you and I have a different definition of a need. Because needs, as I define needs, has contain no reference to what you want the other person to do differently. That's another important thing to do, but we don't want to mix up our needs with our request. Now, it's taken me quite a while to develop a language of needs. I went to schools for 21 years, and I can never recall teachers asking me what my needs were. See, we have been systematically educated for about 8,000 years not to be very clear about our needs. Because we have been educated to obey authority. We have been taught to exist within domination structures in which somebody considers themselves a superior who has a right to control others. And this kind of domination requires a language of domination, a language in which this person claims to know what people are. They know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad, what's selfish, what's unselfish, what's competent, what's incompetent. A very dangerous, tragic language. And that language is needed because within such cultures, the justice system is retributive justice based on punishment and reward. So if you want to make life more miserable on the planet, not only use a language that blames, criticizes, but use punishment or reward to try to influence people. 
Nonviolent communication shows us ways of being more powerful than we can ever be through using punishment or reward. So the, if you are a czar or a king or a president or someone who wants to control those below them, you do not want people to have a consciousness of life, of their needs. Because people do not make good slaves when they're connected to life. So that's why we have been educated to associate the word needs as being needy, selfish, in the wolf world, women are taught loving women have no needs. They sacrifice their needs for their family. Men have been educated to believe that brave men have no needs. They're willing to sacrifice their life for the king, the czar, the president, the flag, or a bunch of other things. That's why in the schools, public schools, the primary objective is obedience to authority. Teachers that I've worked with for the last 35 years almost all say the number one thing they're evaluated by is how controlled the students are in their classroom. When the administrator goes by, is everybody sitting up and looking at the teacher and quiet? So, this is a very important part of nonviolent communication, a need literacy. And what goes with the needs are our feelings. Because when our needs are being fulfilled, we feel pleasureful feelings. When our needs are not being fulfilled, we have painful feelings. So, in nonviolent communication, we evaluate the person's behavior with reference to those three things. A clear observation, and then we tell the person how we feel about what they have done, and then we tell them what need of ours wasn't met. So, that's a language of life. That's being honest by saying what's alive in us. Notice in those three things, there's no insinuation of wrongness on the part of the other person. We're answering the question, how we are, without saying what the other person is. But we don't stop there. We have a very important fourth ingredient that we want to add to that. Because when we tell people what they've done and how it doesn't meet our needs and the discomfort we feel as a result of that, we want to end on a clear request that tells the person what we would appreciate they're doing to better contribute to our well-being. So write that down. Imagine that you've told the person these first three things. You've told them what they've done and how you feel and what need of yours wasn't met. Now add to that a clear request, what you would like the person to do. Now, the important thing here is to make sure that you tell them what you do want rather than what you want them to stop doing. See? So in nonviolent communication, we don't say, I want you to stop that. We say what we want them to start doing, what we want them to do instead. I was working with some teachers in a school they were concerned with the number of broken windows that the students did. And when we got to this part, and I said, what is your request? What is your request of them? One of the teachers said, it's pretty obvious what we want. 
we want them to stop breaking windows. I said, I have an easy answer for you then. She said, oh yeah, what? I said, kill them. <laughs> Recent research shows that dead students break no windows. <laughs> now, as weird as that example is, uh, look in the newspaper on any given day and see how many of our world leaders express their strategies with what they're going to get people to stop doing. And then they use various forms of violence to get people to stop doing it. So in nonviolent communication, we want people to replace what they're doing with something that is better for them and better for us. And we use a very clear language, action language. We don't say what we want the person to be, such as, I want you to be more cooperative. It's too vague. We use very explicit, clear request in making requests. So any questions about those four ingredients that we've looked at so far that uh, comprise, uh, comprise Honesty is defined in nonviolent communication. Everybody's got that mastered already, okay? Now, let's imagine that you decide to try this out. You go up to this person the next time you see them, and as best you can after this very quick introduction, you decide to try it out. So you say those four things to the person. You try to make clear to them what they've done without making any diagnosis. You then go into your heart and say how you feel and what needs of yours aren't being met by the behavior. And you end on a clear request. Now, predict how the person might respond. What would the worst thing be, for example? I want to prepare you tonight for the worst that you could get back. And write that down. Write down what's the worst thing that this person can say. I didn't even have to say something uh, in a refugee camp that I was at in the Middle East. I was working with about 80 people in this refugee camp, and when my interpreter introduced me and said that I was from the United States, I got a free diagnosis. One of the things I like about wolf-speaking people, they're very generous with their diagnoses. <laughs> if you're around a wolf-speaking person, you never have to go to a psychiatrist to find out what's wrong with you. <laughs> You'll always know. So uh, all this person had to do was to hear my interpreter introduce me as from the United States, and one of the people jumped up and said, Murderer! <laughs> Boy, was I glad I had this. <laughs> Because if I had had these ears, oh boy, I probably wouldn't be here tonight. These ears, you see, if somebody says something like that to you, you've got a couple of choices. You can put them on facing inward. And, and then you take what the other person says as a criticism. And you believe it. And you feel like poor protoplasm 
poorly put together. <laughs> More commonly known as depression. Guilt. Shame. Or if you put the ears on the other way, <laughs> you get angry. And then I would have said, you have no right to say that about me. That isn't fair. Who are you to say what I'm a murderer? And some of us have been very well educated to wear these ears. We're ear bidextrous. We can put these ears on both ways very fast, you see. <laughs> So somebody can criticize us and we go, angry, guilty, depressed, angry, guilty, depressed, angry, guilty. <laughs> These ears are distributed to the population by the makers of antidepressant medicine <laughs> and by arms manufacturers and divorce attorneys, you see. Because when people have these ears on, there's going to be a lot of depression, a lot of violence, a lot of relationships are going to get broken. So I was very glad that I had remembered to take my giraffe ears with me that night. And with these ears, I was able to hear him singing a beautiful song. <laughs> See, with these ears on, all you can hear is a divine song being sung by the other person. So what did I hear when I put those ears on? This is what the children at home are saying to you when they say, no. This is what the other person is saying to you. This is what they're singing when they say, the problem with you is, if you have giraffe ears on, here's what you hear going on inside that person. They're singing this song. See me beautiful, look for the best in me. That's what I really am. And all I want to be It may take some time It may be hard to find But see me beautiful See me beautiful Each and every day could you take a chance? Could you find a way to see me shining through in everything I do and see me beautiful? So what did I hear with these ears on? What was beautiful? I heard his pain. I saw his needs. As I was walking into the refugee camp with my colleagues, we had to kick out of the way, out of the path, several empty tear gas grenades that had been fired in there the night before when they had a riot in this refugee camp. And on the side of it was written, Made in USA. So it wasn't too hard to guess what he might be feeling, what his needs might be. But even if you guess wrong, when you are sincerely trying to connect with what another person is feeling and needing, that's very powerful. That tells people that you care 
about how they are. And when people trust that you care how they are, that's your objective, to connect at that level, not to win, not to punish. You have more power. So here's what I said to him when he screamed at me, murderer. I said, sir, are you furious? Because uh, your need for support isn't being met by my country? He was a little shocked to get somebody responding that way. Because when people communicate that way, they usually expect the other person to either put the giraffe ears inward and get very apologetic, or to put them on this way and get into an argument. So he was shocked for a moment. And then he said, you're darn right. We don't have housing. We don't have sewage. Why are you sending the weapons? So, sir, you're saying that it is very painful when you have these basic needs that aren't getting met and you see weapons being sent. You're darn right. Do you know what it's like to live under these conditions? So, sir, you'd like some understanding for how painful it is to live in this way. About 40 minutes later, he invites me to a Ramadan dinner at his house. We now have a nonviolent communication school in that refugee camp. All the parents, all the teachers, all the students learn nonviolent communication. All because of this wonderful technology. Now, for those of you who are a little shy and don't know that you want to be seen walking around town wearing these <laughs> ears, in our workshops, we show people how to put them on internally. So now you see what nonviolent communication looks like. It's, uh, when we speak, we speak from the heart. We're very honest, but honest without blame and without demands, you see. We make clear requests, but never demands. Now what's the difference between a request and a demand? See, they can sound the same, a request and a demand. Because some jackals, they make demands, but they express them in a very polite way. You see. So they will say to their child, I would like very much that you go in and clean up your room. <laughs> and the child says, no. And then they turn pretty brutal. Did you hear what I said? Blah, 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 blah. So if people expect that when we make a request, that if we don't do as they request, they're going to be blamed or criticized, they hear a demand. So it's important when we make requests in nonviolent communication that it is a request. That, our, that the person knows that our objective is not to get what we want. We are trying to make a connection that will get everybody's needs met. So yes, we say what we want, but we only want the person to do it if they do it willingly. Now when people trust that, they're far more likely to do it. So, that's not an overview of nonviolent communication in conflict situations. It involves saying what's alive in us and what would make and what we would like to make things more wonderful. And then no matter how the other person responds, all we hear is what's alive in them and what would make life more wonderful for them. And my experience is that when we can connect in that way, we can find a way to get everybody's needs met. Now, one woman came to a training I did. This was a three-day training, fortunately, because did, I didn't make it too clear to her after the first day. 
She came in the second day and said, Marshall, I went home and tried it, and it didn't work. Well, I said, let's learn from it. Let's hear what you actually said. And she did a very good job with the mechanics. She made a clear request, uh, she made a clear observation to her son. She noticed that he didn't do three things that he said he was going to do. And she expressed her feelings clearly. She expressed her needs clearly. And she made a clear request. So I said, well, you got the mechanics right. That sounds very much like nonviolent communication. What's the problem? She said, he didn't do it. <laughs> I said, then what did you do? I told him he couldn't go through life being lazy and irresponsible. <laughs> I said, I'm glad we've got two more days of this workshop because uh, I can see that I have made the mechanics clear to you, but I haven't made clear what the purpose is. It sounds like you thought the purpose is to get what you want. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's not the purpose of nonviolent communication, to get what you want. It's to create a connection that allows everybody's needs to get met. That's quite different. Where everybody does whatever they do willingly. That's the purpose. Not just to get what you want. If your objective is to just get people to do what you want, don't learn nonviolent communication. Go to a dog obedience school <laughs> and, and see how they train the dogs. You see. Very hard for many people to learn, especially when they are in the position of authority. Parents, teachers, bosses. It's real scary for them, the beginning of nonviolent communication. They often mix it up with meaning that we don't have standards or rules. And you just let people do whatever they want. That's not it at all. We'll have far more order, far more willing conformity to rules when people see how needs are met by these rules. And they see the rules enforced by the protective use of force, not punishment. See, in nonviolent communication, we never use punishment, but sometimes force, yes. So in our training, we show people the difference between the protective use of force and the punitive use of force. So that's how we deal with conflict situations in nonviolent communication. But now let's see how we celebrate life in nonviolent communication. How we express sincere gratitude. And not get it mixed up with praise and compliments. When I say to people, uh, teachers, parents, managers in industry, I suggest, for example, the book Punished by Rewards by Elfie Cohn. And I point out the violence of rewards. And uh, this really upsets people. They can't imagine going through life uh, how you'd get anything done without rewards. Uh, they tell me they've been through training programs that tell them if you praise and compliment children, students, employees daily. Research shows they produce more. I suggest that they look at closely at the research and I think they will see that it only works for a short time until people see the manipulation of the gratitude, of the, the praise and the compliment. So in nonviolent communication we do something far more powerful than compliment or praise far more honest. We express sincere gratitude. Sincere gratitude. That involves the same three characteristics that we looked at in telling people what we don't like. Where I, we make clear observations and then tell people how we feel and what our needs are. Those same three ingredients are how we express gratitude in nonviolent communication. 
Only now we're talking about something the person did that enriched our life. And the motive is not to motivate them. It's not to reward them. The motive is just to celebrate, to celebrate how our needs were fulfilled by what they did. I didn't make this very clear to a group of teachers I was working with in Switzerland. And after the workshop, one of the teachers came running up to me and said, you're brilliant. I said, it doesn't help. She said, huh? I said, I have been called a lot of names in my life. Some positive and some far from positive. And I can never recall learning anything of value by somebody telling me what I am. I doubt that anybody does. But I can see in your eyes that you'd like to express a gratitude. Yes. And I'd like to receive it, but telling me what I am doesn't give me what I need to really celebrate with you. Well, what do you need to hear? <laughs> Remember what I said at the end of the workshop, those three things? Like, first of all, what did I do that made life more wonderful for you? She said, you're so intelligent. <laughs> doesn't help, doesn't help. Oh, I understand, I understand. And she opened up her notebook, and she pointed to two things she had written there. She said, you said these two things. Yeah, I did, I did. I did say those two things. I said, already, you see, that's more helpful to me than her telling me I'm brilliant. Just that I know that somehow those two things, my saying them, had enriched her life in some way. Now I said it would really help me celebrate that if I knew how you feel as a result of what I said. She said, I feel hopeful and relieved. Oh, and now if you can tell me what need of yours got met that leaves you feeling hopeful and relieved, then I can really take in that gratitude and celebrate it. She said, Marshall, I've got an 18-year-old son, and whenever we have a difference, it just gets worse and worse and I have been desperately needing some concrete direction for how to connect with him. She said, those two things you said really met that need. Now, put yourself in my shoes, uh, you see. Do you want to hear a, 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 a compliment, or do you want to see clearly how your behavior enriched the person's life? And do you want to have in your head the worry of what are they trying to get from me? Or would you just like to trust that when somebody does celebrate something you've done, they don't have that other motive mixed in, that they're trying to get you to keep doing it? So that's how we express gratitude. Now one of the hardest things is how to receive gratitude in a nonviolent way. Let me show you how wolf-speaking people receive gratitude. If you want to scare the heck out of a wolf, express sincere gratitude to them. Wolf, when you offered uh, me the ride home today, I'm very grateful because uh, I really have a need to be with my uncle who's visiting, so it's, it really meets a need of mine. Okay, so I express this gratitude Already I see terror in the wolf's eyes. <laughs> and you all know what's coming, right? Mr. Duncan. <laughs> it's nothing. See, it terrorizes wolves to receive gratitude. See, I've asked a lot of wolves around the world why they're so scared of getting gratitude. And some of them say, what's wrong with being humble? <laughs> and I have a cure for that. I suggest they uh, read what Golda Meir, the Israeli prime minister, once said to one of her humble politicians. She said, don't be so humble, you're not that great.
And uh, so, how do we receive gratitude in uh, nonviolent communication? With empathy, the same empathy with which we receive people's pain. We see what's in their heart. We see what we've done, how they feel, what needs were met. So we put all these three things together, and that is what nonviolent communication is all about. It's a language of life, you see. It helps us to stay connected with life, moment by moment. But it's hard to do. It's hard to take in this gratitude if you have been educated in a wolf way. See, as they say in The Course in Miracles, it's our light, not our darkness, that scares us the most. So uh, we're not used to really seeing the power that we have as human beings to enrich life. We're not educated to see that we have this divine energy that we have power to enrich people's lives and that there's nothing that we like better than doing that. But to do that requires this liberation from this language we have been taught, this liberation from tactics of coercion, punishment, reward, guilt induction. We didn't talk much about guilt induction. I assume you all know how to do it, right? But just in case you haven't been taught how to use guilt in a violent way, let me show you how to do it. So this is one of my children who hasn't cleaned up their room to my satisfaction. Okay. Now the first step in, making, in trying to induce guilt, you have to know how to look pathetic. <laughs> so put yourself where the child can see you and look pathetic. What's the matter, Dad? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Come on, Dad, what's the matter? It hurts me when you don't clean up your room. <laughs> now you'll have 18 years of daily fights about the room when you use feelings that way. See, in nonviolent communication, we never blame others for their fe our feelings. We say what they've done, but we connect our feelings to our needs. We don't blame other people for them. So we don't use blame induction. We don't use guilt, shame, none of that. What we do is we trust life. We trust that if we stay connected to life, Everybody's needs can get met. So in a sense, it helps to think of nonviolent communication as a dance of life, where we connect with the life in the other, and the other connects with the life in us. Mit dem Leben tanzen, wie die Blätter mit der Sonne, die Pflanzen mit dem Regen, wie die Vogel mit dem Korn, mit dem Leben tanzen. Wieder und wieder, auf vielerlei Weisen, wir haben uns zu geben, wir haben uns zu leben, wieder und wieder. Lasst uns feiern die Freude am Leben in jedem Atemzug, in jedem Augenblick. Lasst uns feiern mit dem Leben tanzen wie die Blätter mit der Sonne, wie die Pflanzen mit dem Regen, wie die Vogel mit dem Korn. Dem Leben tanzen.
I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, my high German is getting better. <laughs> I did that once in Schweizerdeutsch in Zurich, and a woman asked me afterwards, what language was that? <laughs> Uh, I, I'm living in Switzerland, you know, for a long time, but I just, there's some things about it I don't get, like where I live up in the mountains. When you pass people, you say, Grüezi uh, mitanan. And when you sit down at a meal, you say, Aguete mitanan. And one night after a workshop, I said, Schlaf gut mitanan. gar nicht leicht, hier etwas zu sagen, weil es meistens ja nicht hilft. <laughs> it's not so easy to say something, but because mostly it doesn't help. I learned that. So just thank you very much from all our heart. Thank you, Marsha. Vielen Dank für heute und einen schönen Abend und eine gute, ertragreiche Nacht. <lacht> Noch eine. Jetzt noch eine kleine Ansage nur für die Referenten, weil das vielleicht nicht alle erreicht hat. Es gibt jetzt noch ein kleines.